Welcome back. In the next videos, we are going to look at how to sort values, which means our tasks will look like this. We have a list of values in an arbitrary order, and we want to put these in an order where each value is at least as large as its predecessor. The main tool we will use to do this is the comparison. It doesn't matter whether we want to sort numbers or text or other data. As long as we can always say for two values which one needs to come after the other, we can sort them. This makes the algorithms we want to look at extremely flexible. For the sake of simplicity, we'll still only sort numbers in the upcoming videos. But you should keep in mind that we can apply these algorithms to other kinds of data as well. But why is sorting so important anyway? On the one hand, problems are often faster and easier to solve when the input is sorted. We saw this in the last video. On the other hand, I want to show you some interesting general algorithmic concepts using sorting algorithms as an example such as divide and conquer, the role of randomness when analyzing algorithms, or so-called priority queue data structures. Let's look at the first simple sorting algorithm, selection sort. For selection sort, we first look for the largest value in the array. This value should be sorted to the last position, so we swap it with the rightmost element. Then we look for the next largest value. This one happens to be at the right position already. The next largest value is 7. We swap it to the correct position as well. And we'll keep going like this. Every time, we simply swap the last element with the next largest value until we've sorted all the values. How can we implement selection sort? We first need a small helper function. It just swaps two values in the array. To do this, it needs to store one of them in a temporary variable. Otherwise, it would simply overwrite the other one. The actual algorithm looks like this. First we look for the largest value from all n values, then from all values but the last one, and so on. After we have found the next largest value, we swap it with the currently last position. We do this until all values are sorted. Of course, we are interested again in how fast the algorithm is. Maybe you already have a guess about what the time complexity could be. Finding the maximum takes linear time, and we need to do this n times. So intuitively, the running time seems to be quadratic, that we have two nested for loops seems to confirm this hypothesis. But be careful, the outer loop does go through n iterations, but the inner loop does not always need the same number of iterations. At the beginning, we still have to look at all values, but the more values we have sorted in, the fewer values we still need to compare. If we look closely, we find that the first time the inner loop goes through n iterations, the second time it goes through n minus 1 iterations, and so on until we end up needing only one iteration at the end. This means that the total number of iterations of the inner loop is simply the sum of all the numbers from 1 to n. In mathematical notation, you write it like this. Since we're adding n numbers, all between 1 and n, the sum must be somewhere between n and n squared. But how big is it exactly? There's a clever trick to work out the sum. Suppose we want to add up the numbers from 1 to 5. We picture each number as a set of that many squares. How many squares do we have in total? If we duplicate the triangle and rotate it, we get a rectangle that is 5 squares tall and 6 wide. So this rectangle contains 30 squares, and the original triangle is half of that, namely 15 squares. Of course this trick not only works for 5, but for any number. The number of squares is always half of the rectangle. So we found a simple formula for the sum of the numbers from 1 to n. If we rearrange the formula slightly, we see that it consists of a quadratic term and a linear term. So the sum of the first n numbers increases quadratically. We know now that the inner loop alone already takes quadratic running time. On top of that, we need some linear time in the outer loop plus some constant time. The running time of selection sort is therefore n squared. This is true for both the worst case and the best case. Let's look at another sorting algorithm, bubble sort. Bubble sort works a little bit differently than selection sort. First, we compare the leftmost two values. If they are in the wrong order, that is, the right one is smaller, we swap them. Then we look at the next two values. These are already in the correct order, so we go to the next two. And we keep doing that until we reach the end of the array. As with selection sort, the largest value, here 6, is in its final position. This is because 6 is larger than all other values, so it ends up on the right side after each comparison. Because we walked from left to right, 
we basically pulled 6 all the way to the right. So just like before, we never have to look at the last value again. But the remaining values are not sorted yet. So we just run through the array again. And then again. You may notice that 1, the smallest value, moves only one position to the left in each pass. So in this example, we need the full 5 passes to move the 1 from right to left. The code of bubble sort looks quite similar to that of selection sort, with the exception that we only ever compare adjacent values. If you look closely, you may notice that both loops take one fewer iteration each time. The total number of iterations of the inner loop can therefore be expressed by this sum. This looks a bit more complicated than selection sort, but if we look at the individual terms, you can see that it's basically the same sum as before, except that it now runs to n-1 instead of n. So we can just plug n-1 into our formula. This again results in quadratic running time. There are a few ways we can improve this algorithm. For example, you can ask yourself, do we always need to run through the array n times? In the previous example, we indeed needed all n passes as we had to move the smallest value all the way to the left. But this is not always the case. Once the array is sorted, the order will not change, because then adjacent values are always in the right order and will never swap. So a possible optimization is to terminate early as soon as the order does not change anymore. We can do this for example by counting how often two values were swapped in the current pass. If there were no swaps in one pass, the order won't change in the next pass either, so the array is fully sorted. What is the running time of this improved version of bubble sort? In the best case, the array is sorted already. We can then return after the first pass, so we only need linear time for this one pass. In the worst case, however, we need all passes, of course. As we've just seen, the running time is then quadratic. We might also be interested in the average case. If we receive an array in some random order, what is the running time then? This is not so easy to answer. We will see how to compute average running time in the next video using another sorting algorithm as an example. Let's recap. We have learned about two simple sorting algorithms in this video. Selection sort which repeatedly selects the largest value in the array and swaps it with the last element. And bubble sort, which repeatedly swaps adjacent values, gradually bubbling large values up to the end of the array. We found that the running time of both algorithms essentially depends on the sum of all the numbers from 1 to n. Thus, both algorithms have quadratic running time in the worst case. And finally, we looked at an optimization of bubble sort that allows us to get the best case from n squared down to n. Selection sort and bubble sort, while easy to understand, are not particularly good sorting algorithms. In the next video, we will look at insertion sort, an algorithm that is actually used in practice. For the first time, we will also look at how to compute its average running time. I will see you in the next video.